Good morning. I am Jody Skogan. I'm pastor of Oasis Church, and we are so glad that you're with us today. We are worshiping online. We do have a skeleton crew here um, putting all of this together that we can uh, worship with you online. So I will be looking at them a little bit during the message. Um, but by and large, you're all online, and we're so glad that you've chosen to tune in this morning. We pray that you would uh, stay with us and worship with us as we uh, go to God's Word for truth and encouragement and hope and help, because my word, we really need it. So uh, we're glad that you're here. If you would take a minute and go to our website, oasisfamily.org, there you'll see a tab. It says worshiping with us. You click there and you can just check in and let us know that you are with us. If you have any prayer requests, you can certainly share something like that too, if you'd like, uh, but we would love to have you check in if you would, please. Uh, let's pray as we begin our time of worship together. Let's go to the Lord together. God, thank you for the opportunity to connect uh, with people all across the nation, potentially even across the world, uh, this morning as we gather in your name, Jesus. We ask that you would uh, remind us of the things that we need to hear from you today, of your grace, of your mercy, of your unconditional love. And God, would you just coach us a bit today? Would you lead us a little bit closer to your, um, your heart for us, God? And and how you'd like to speak into our lives uh, with, with goodness and truth. And, uh, and lead us here, Lord, that our hearts would be drawn to you, God. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to begin by worshiping the Lord. He's the way maker. He uh, brings so much of what we need. And so if you're at home, feel free to stand if you'd like to. You can stay seated, uh, whatever. But let's draw our hearts to God out of the truth of who he is and praise him. Yes, Lord. We celebrate you today. All that you are your forgiveness, your love. We celebrate that you're here. Wherever we are, you're with us. We worship you. Thank you. 
Good morning. My name is Christine, and I'm here to do the children's message this morning. And even if you don't have kids with you around the computer or the TV or whatever you happen to be watching us on, this is for you as well. We're going to do some interactive um, stuff this morning. So we need you online on the comments um, because today is a very special day. Today is the day that we start our countdown to Christmas. There are a lot of things that people do to get ready for Christmas. There's tons of things people do to get ready for Christmas. And so what I'd like to see are some of the things that you do out there online community. And kids, if you're around the, if you're around the TV or the computer with your mom and dad, give them some ideas to put into the comments. What are some of those things that we do to prepare for Christmas? When you think about getting ready for Christmas, what are all of those things? I'm gonna give you a minute or two to kind of come up with some ideas and put them in the comments on our live stream. All right, we've got a lot of things that we do to prepare for Christmas. I've got put up a Christmas tree. I've got two phones going here. So um, put up lights, stockings, get out the elf. <laughs> One of my biggest regret as a parent. Um, let's shop for gifts, the advent calendar. Um, we've got decorate the Christmas tree, display the nativity scene handed down from mom. I have the same thing. Um, I have a nativity scene I put on my mantle every year. To, I love that. Baking, yes. Putting up advent calendars, writing a gift list. I know I ask my kids for their list every year, too. There are so many things we do to get ready for Christmas. We have to get Christmas cards addressed and mailed. I don't know if we all do that as much as we used to. There's a lot of social media that does that for us now, but I love getting Christmas cards in the actual snail mail. Um, cooking um, and all the food for Christmas dinner and the cleaning and the getting ready for company to come over. If you host Christmas, so many things to get ready. And while we're preparing and getting ready for Christmas, there's something else we have to be prepared for as well. Jesus promised that he would come again, and the Bible tells us that we must be watching and be prepared for him when he comes. So we prepare so much for Christmas. What can we be doing to preparing for him to come again? We prepare for his birth, but we're also in the middle of preparing for him to come again. We all know when Christmas is coming but we don't know when Jesus is coming again. And the Bible even says that no one knows the hour of his return. Not even the angels who announced his birth know when he will come again. So I want you to think about, as we listen to Pastor Jody's message today, ways that you can be prepared and become and, and um, how we might prepare for him when he is coming again. Maybe kids out there, you want to draw a picture of what that might look like, or make a list of the things you want to make sure you're remembering to do every day as you prepare, because we are preparing for Christmas now, but always and always and every day we're preparing for Jesus' return and for him to come back. Um, that's what we're here for. So take some time, draw your picture, make a list, and enjoy the message that we have from Jody. Thanks.
powerful, uh, powerful song as we focus our eyes on Jesus today. Uh, would you pray with me, please? Lord, uh, this time of a message, I, I pray that uh, you would speak, Lord, um, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, Lord. And if it's not, I pray you'd stop it, or <laughs> that you would uh, redirect it, God, that, that each of us might hear from you today uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it is the first Sunday in Advent. When I was growing up, um, my family, we had an Advent calendar. Perhaps you're familiar with one of these. For us, it hung on the door in the closet, uh, the, the hallway. There was a closet hung on the door of the closet. And every day we would um, open up what was in one of the pockets as we headed toward Christmas Eve. Uh, in those pockets, they were numbered. There was a little felt piece, some kind of cutout of an object like a bell or a bird or something like that. And then there was a little slip of paper. We would pull it out and we would read it. And it would work to prepare us for what was coming uh, for Christmas Eve. But for me, Every single one we pulled out, it was just like, I can't believe it's going to be that long yet before Christmas Eve. Uh, for me, the Advent calendar just showed me how much time was left, and it felt like it was so long. I don't know if you have an Advent calendar, if that's a part of your family's um, tradition. Actually, I googled Advent calendars the other day. There's a Star Wars Advent calendar. Who knew? I, I would love to see it point to Jesus. I'm not sure it does, but it definitely is counting down to an expectation that people have for what's coming on Christmas Eve, whether they know about uh, Jesus or not. My hope is that even an Advent calendar like a Star Wars or a Lego one would help them anticipate what's coming. Another thing when I was a, a child growing up in our home church was the Advent wreath. The Advent wreath sat up in front of the uh, worship uh, place. And every Sunday before Christmas, we'd light another candle. In fact, we're really blessed. We have an Advent wreath uh, that came together, honestly, in the last 24 hours. So that's pretty fun. Uh, one candle is lit today. And for me growing up, again, this was just another reminder of how slow the month of December went. <laughs> Basically, like, seriously, we're only on week two. We have two more weeks left. And as a child, it felt like weeks, well, I think for us adults, weeks go faster now. But for kids, um, they seem to go slower. And so uh, every week, there would be one more candle lit. And it, again, felt like so long, so much waiting. That was a bit of my experience around Advent. And uh, the thing is, the, the waiting, the impatience maybe that we feel sometimes as kids, maybe us as adults too, is just a snippet of what God's people were waiting for in the Messiah. Waiting and longing for what was anticipated. Advent, this season that comes right before Christmas, means coming or arrival. So there's this waiting for the arrival of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Messiah, the long-promised one. I don't know if you know this, but all the way back in Genesis, we start hearing about the one who will come and take care of the brokenness and the sin that started in the Garden of Eden. Way back in Genesis, in fact, I would love, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd love to have you turn to Genesis with me. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 3. I mean, very beginning. Sin is on the loose. Sadly, disobedience and the, the, the threat of, um, and the cunning ways and the lies of the enemy have caused Eve and Adam to want to go their own way, want to disobey God. And so sin is already wreaking havoc. And there's this serpent that, that the enemy is, uh, is in. And we hear this dialogue after sin has had its way, or the very start of it in creation. In Genesis chapter 3, verse uh, 15, this is what God has to say to the serpent. And again, it's already at the very beginning of history talking about who is to come. And it says this, God says to the serpent, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, he says to the serpent. 
I'm going to put this hate or this, this, this division, this enmity between you and the woman. And I agree because every time I see a snake, I'm not feeling love at all. <laughs> I know we have one Oasis family that has a snake as a pet, but, uh, and I've seen it. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not feeling super um, connected to it. Okay, so I will put enmity between you and the woman. And listen to what God says. And between your offspring of the serpent and her offspring. Now, who is God talking about? Eve's offspring. We know that there will come a Messiah who will have something to do with the enemy of God, will have something to say, and it's not a loving relationship at that point. There is enmity between the enemy and the Messiah. And what's going to happen? It says, he shall bruise your head. That's the Messiah. Will bruise your head, serpent. Which, by the way, if you're going to have an injury, your head is not the one, the place you want it to be. And yet there will be injury on the other side too, God says, and you shall bruise his heel. We, for, we look ahead from this point to the reality of the cross. There will be a day, God says, that the enemy will bruise the heel of the offspring of Eve. But a lethal blow will be brought to the enemy on the cross and in the resurrection. So way back there, we start hearing about the Messiah, the promised one, the one who will come and destroy evil and death and the devil. And then we go to Isaiah. Isaiah, again in the Old Testament, it's prophecy hundreds of years before Jesus comes to earth. And there's tons of prophecies about the Messiah and Jesus. In him, all these things come true. But let's check out Isaiah uh, chapter 9. This is the, probably the, the messianic prophecy that we hear most during Christmas time. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What's his kingdom going to look like? What's his reign going to look like? It goes on in verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. Sounds good to me. Yes, please. Sign me up. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts, of of angels, will do this. The Lord of heaven's armies will have, see this come to be. So God's people in the midst of the brokenness and the despair and even hopelessness sometimes, the lack of freedom, the captivity, the oppression, in the midst of disease and death and sin, are anticipating the Messiah who will come. All the way foretold from Genesis through the Old Testament and the prophets, especially Isaiah, and now it's time. Okay, God is like, here is, it's it's time for the main show. Jesus is about to appear, and we're going to read about Uh, that, and we're going to dig into that in Luke and Matthew chapters 1 and 2 here in this new sermon series called uh, Prepared and Present. The prophets foretold this one who would come and make all things that are wrong right again. And we live right now, and this is the end of November 2020, in a time where we are understanding Uh, the angst of the waiting, maybe more than at least in uh, my generation um, have experienced with the reality of COVID. We can't wait for this thing to be over, right? I mean, we cannot wait for a time when we won't need to wear masks, where we won't have to socially distance. We can't wait for the vaccine, for the cure, for us to be able to gather without fear. We cannot wait. We're so eager for the day when we can hug our loved ones, where we can shake hands even with those we've just met. We can't wait. We've got this understanding maybe in a new way of the angst that perhaps God's people were experiencing back in Jesus' day as they were waiting for the long-awaited, is he here yet? Are we ready? How many more candles do we need to light before Christmas Eve, right? I mean, that sort of a waiting and an anticipation. So we, we come together here between now and Christmas Eve in Oasis Church 
mostly online, to together anticipate, to experience Advent, to wait and to wonder at what it will be like when Jesus comes to make everything that is broken right again. So we light candles once a week, and we'll be doing that here as well. And the picture of the candle is so beautiful because in the darkest night, the light shines in the darkness. In John chapter 1, and we've been spending some time in John in the two sermon series that we've done so far, but in John chapter 1, it says about Jesus, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Not even death could keep Jesus down. He is the light. So even in the darkest night, we look to him. Now, um, I think about a couple of horizons, and I want us to think about the reality of life and of a relationship with God in three horizons. I want to show you a couple pictures of, um, I think it was like last week or the week before. I caught some, uh, some of God's wonder on camera with a couple of pictures of the sunrise that day. And I want to get those on the screen for you too. So in the darkest night, there's an opportunity at the break of day to look to the horizon. And slowly you start seeing a little bit of light and a little bit of color. And as the minutes clicked by, I was able to capture some of these pictures. And you can see just right there, you can see how there's this beam of light. You cannot see the sun yet, but you can see this beam of light. You can see evidence of the appearing, the coming. It's on its way, right? And so I think there might be a couple of more as we anticipate the reality of the sun rising. And today and this week and at the beginning of Advent here, We look with expectation, with longing for Jesus coming. We look for evidence of his preparation, uh, his coming. And so the horizons I'm talking about that I'd like us to think about during this season are three. One, the past. We're going to look at the Christmas story. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be digging into parts of the Christmas story in Luke and Matthew in those first two chapters of each one of those books. And we're going to dig deeply into some people's lives who were radically impacted on that first Christmas. And we're going to learn some things we've never heard before. Now, we might be very familiar with the Christmas story. Perhaps some people listening maybe aren't. Um, But we're going to dig deeper and hopefully be surprised by God at some things that we haven't realized before as we look back to the past when Jesus came on that first uh, Christmas Eve. We're going to look there. That's one horizon, that of the past. We're going to look here at the present, the present horizon. What is God up to today? What is he doing here in our midst, in our church family, in our world? How is he preparing us and how is he present here in the present. And then the third horizon I want us to think about is that of the future. Christine touched on it. Thank you so much. We don't just anticipate Christmas Eve and Christmas Day 2020 because, uh, you know, good things can come that day. And even in 2021, we're hopeful for what's going to come. We talked about COVID. But none of those things will ultimately be the Messiah, until Jesus returns. And he's promised to return throughout Scripture. And so we look at today, what's he doing now? How is he showing up um, to bring hope and help and healing now, not just in the future, but now through us, his people? And then lastly, the third horizon is the future. So past Christmas, present now, future. What is God doing to prepare and be present for what's to come in the future. And we're going to look to the anticipation of Jesus' ultimate return that will indeed bring all things that are wrong and bring it right. And wow, what a sweet day that will be. And it's okay if sometimes we feel impatient. Now, I don't know if you've looked around, watched the news, felt it in your own heart, but there's a lot of things that are broken right now. And it's in the midst of knowing and acknowledging that, that we feel the pain and the desire for things to get better, to be made right. And the only one who can ultimately make that right is Jesus. And then Jesus in and through us. 
So we're going to use that uh, waiting, that expectation, that even impatience to take note. Now, one of the things about preparing and, uh, is, uh, and I think about this metaphor of a coach, okay? So we actually have a number of people in Oasis Church who have been <laughs> coaches or have been under coaches, and we maybe know the difference between a good coach and a not-so-good coach. Uh, and I like to think about God a little bit like a coach sometimes, so I'm going to use that metaphor in this series um, about coaches and about who God is. Well, when I met Dan, uh, it was kind of a while ago now, 2000, he was a coach. He was a, a freshman basketball coach. And I remember even on our first date, Dan was sharing with me his philosophy about coaching. I remember him saying how he had had coaches who motivated players in different ways. You know, some motivate through encouragement, coming alongside, giving some individual encouraging coaching, and then some, maybe a different tactic. Kind of the yelling, like, gotta get it together, let's go. Well, maybe, the, maybe even harsher than that, right? I remember him talking even on our first date about his philosophy for coaching and his desire was to be one who would encourage who had come alongside. He felt like that was the best way. And I really believe that's such a cool picture of who God is, who desires to sometimes, I mean, a good coach needs to give specific instruction, maybe specific correction, and God does that. But he does that in love and with encouragement, uh, challenge and invitation. Now, when it comes to uh, basketball, for me, I think coaches had kind of a hard time. <laughs> So I, I remember being in middle school. This was back when uh, girls played six-on-six six, uh, basketball, and I was a forward, right? So I was on offense, and I remember this very clearly. So it was time to go in because I did not start games. Okay. Uh, so it was time for me to go in, into the game, and so uh, my fellow offensive uh, team players, we get out on the floor, and man, here we go, and we're dribbling, and we take a shot, and then, um, gosh, you know, there's this, like, unusual amount of cheering that's happening, uh, which was kind of new to me. And, and I was like, well, what's going on? And, and uh, we go for a shot, and I think it's kind of cool because we're here in a basketball court right here. It's in a court. I actually belong on a court, only for this. Uh, but anyway, because this story will help you understand it, but we go for a shot, and then we realize, oh, whoops, we're on the wrong side of the court. We're actually trying to make a basket in the opponent's hoop. This is not good. So coaches uh, for basketball, anyway, for me, had their hands, hands full. Their ends um, kind, of, it kind of frames up my whole relationship with um, athletics because my, my main role <laughs> wasn't to play. But when it comes to like being a cheerleader, dance team, okay, that's me. Pick me. That's where I'm at. And that is, by the way, a very athletic thing. So we could talk about that another time. But that is real, and that sort of solidified my role in athletics that moment. Um, one of the critical roles about a coach is to uh, prepare his or her team for what's to come. And one of the ways a coach does that is take note of strengths and areas in need of improvement, right? A good coach would look at the individual players and collectively the team and say, hmm, what am I noticing? What needs some encouragement? What strengths do I want to build on? What are some areas that need some shoring up? A good coach will work to prepare his or her team so that that team is prepared for game time. That team is ready for when it's time to play ball. That's what a good coach does, and I think that's one of the best attributes of God. He's a good coach. He looks at his team individually and collectively, and I like to think of that even with Oasis Church. And he says, man, I, I see that in him, and I see that in her, and I want to grow that. I want to help. I want to maybe bring some correction to that. I want to teach them a new way of living. I want to help them out. I want to increase their areas of strength so that they might be prepared. I love that about our good coach. So in this series, I want us to consider how God is preparing us, how he has prepared us, and how he's preparing us now and for the future. Each week, we're going to look at different people in the story of God's coming to the earth 
uh, as a baby. We're going to look at Zechariah and Elizabeth and baby John. It's a story that really kind of often gets looked over, and that's what we're going to get after next week. And then Mary and Joseph and the people that were surrounding them as this crazy thing was happening where God was coming to earth in human form, in human flesh, and was doing some incredible things as a coach in preparing and being very, very present. So how is it that we're going to prepare in this season as we wait and anticipate Christmas Eve this year? I want us to get practical for a second. And I want to, I want to challenge you. I think this might be a challenge from God for us. I want to invite you to prepare in a way that's maybe more um, deliberate, more intentional than we've done before. And honestly, I think that God has been possibly preparing us for that opportunity in the midst of such a strange season in our world. And that's to do something counterintuitive to everything else that we've been maybe taught or trained to do when it comes to Christmas. And I love that long list. And there are many, many things to do that Christine was inviting you all to contribute to. The list is long of things to be done to prepare. But I want to encourage you to work really hard at one more additional way of preparing. And that's, that's kind of like Jesus. He flips things upside down often. This is going to be a challenge that might even be harder than actually doing something. My encouragement to you is to do less. To do, do something that we might not be very familiar with, which is rest. We tend to rest when we're exhausted. I want to invite you to rest in preparation in preparation for what's to come. I want to invite you to think about saying time out. If this is a basketball game, sometimes the coach needs to call a time out, right? And say, hey, hey, team, team, come, come on. He gathers or she gathers them around and gives some encouragement. We're going to be doing that. We're going to be gathering around God's word this season. And we're going to listen. What is it, coach? What do you, what do you got for us? What do we need to hear? And we're going to listen for how the, a good coach, by the way, is good at utilizing time well, right? I mean, how, much, how many seconds in a timeout? I've got a number of basketball players here in the skeleton crew. How many? 30 or 60 seconds. Now, that time is especially important, right, when that last timeout, right before the last few seconds of the game, <laughs> and we're down one point, right, and it's like, okay, what are we going to do, team? Here we go. A timeout, timeout is called. The, the coach gathers us around, and he, sa- he might look at his playbook, or he might have it just so right up in here that he says, this is it. You ready? You guys got this. Let's do this. We're in it together. I'm standing right here with you. I am cheering you on, and come loss or come win, which by by the way, we know who the victory belongs to ultimately. We are in this together, and that's a good coach, and I think he's calling a timeout for us, maybe even as a culture, as a nation, as a country, as a world, but down to individual families and family members to say, time out. I want you to rest in preparation for what is to come. This is a topic that's super intriguing to me. And whenever a theme comes up in several areas of my life, it's like, I'm like, okay, Lord, you're trying to get my attention. I get it. So uh, there, somebody shared this magazine with me, Magnolia Journal. Love it. Okay, some of you know this uh, well. Some of you are like, what's that? In fact, I, I talked to a coworker this week who had no idea. Magnolia. Anyway, um, if you don't know, HGTV, Chip and Joanna Gaines, okay, Um, this is a really, really great magazine, and I don't know that you can see the cover of this journal, um, this magazine that just came out. It's the December edition. Can we, like, zoom in, Glenn? I mean, like, we are not really interested in being super polished. We hadn't talked about doing this. Can you see this? All right, Magnolia Journal, Joanna and Chip Gaines, and the, and all throughout the, the, (laughs) The headings of this magazine, making space for rest that restores us. This whole magazine is dedicated to having us think about the need for rest. I want to read for you from the letter, letter from the editor section on page 12 of this magazine, just a couple sentences here. Joanna Gans writes this, it may seem counterintuitive, maybe even a little naive, to suggest prioritizing rest in what is typically the busiest time of year. 
But I've come to learn that it's often in the slow and simple moments that we're able to really feel the thrill of the holidays. And it's in the quiet that we hear clearly the goodness of life happening all around us. The concept of slowing down might make some of us uncomfortable. It's almost become second nature to constantly be in pursuit of what's next, to look ahead at where we're going before we've even had a chance to acknowledge where we've been. Good theme, huh? Perhaps a good call to us from a coach who says it's time for a time out. Let's rest. Let's rest together. Uh, winter reminds us of rest, doesn't it? We don't have snow yet here in Iowa. Well, we have. It's melted, but we don't have it out there now. But winter is sort of this time where things that have been growing go dormant, where they kind of have a moment of rest, a time to re, um, kind of reset a little bit. But, you know, before we know it, that grass that's out there and the grass that will soon be covered with snow will be again under the scorching heat of the August sun. There's work to be done, but there's time to press pause and to rest. I got, I got to share with you uh, another part. It's an essay on rest in the magazine, and uh, here's a little bit of it. It says, without rest, our minds and muscles and eyes weaken, and we're reminded that we're not created to be machines, cranking out product nonstop. We need rest. For too long, we found our value and how much we accomplish in the hashtag hustle. It's trendy to talk about rest, and the world has a lot to say about it, but as it is with most things, we come up short in our understanding. We cheapen rest, reducing it to a few breaks here and there to scroll social media. She goes on, but then toward the end of this essay, it says, um, let's see. Those of us who need to hear it most are the ones who find our value and worth and identity in what we do in a day and how much we get done and how much we achieve. Yes, we should rest, but not just for the sake of resting and not in some aimless way. Rest must go hand in hand with all the work that is inherent in this world, emotional work, physical work, relational work, occupational work, intellectual work. All must be accompanied by rest. We rest because it allows us to separate our identity from what we produce in a day. We rest because we can't put our best foot forward running on fumes. We rest because there is good work still to be done. Love it. Need it. I don't know about all the rest of you. I know for our ways this church, our coaches, it's our leaders of our areas of ministry. We meet every Monday. And over the past couple months, really, we've uh, been bothered, I would say, by the need to have a sustainable plan for Oasis Church. And a huge part of that is rest. How do we sustain what God's put before us if we just think we have to produce and work and do it and um, work harder and, and put in more hours, but instead a good coach invites us to rest when it's appropriate so that we can be ready to play the game when we need to. And I'm really thankful um, for our team of leaders who have a burden for us to do Oasis Church in a sustainable way, in a way that produces life. I mean, really, our name sort of is a mandate for us about <laughs> not, not burning out. I mean, it, it sort of bothers us to say, well, things at the Oasis grow. They don't wilt under overwork. Um, and so it's pretty sweet to see God's heart for us and that sort of mandate to us to do this in his way. And so his way, my friends, is to prepare us and he promises to be present with us. This sermon series, and you can see the picture here, prepared and present. God was prepared and present in the very first Christmas. Today, he has been preparing us and is preparing us still and is present with us. And in the future, we are promised, 
and we count on the promise that he is preparing us now for what that will be, and he will indeed be present. Jesus said to his disciples, um, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And remember that I will be with you every, even till the end of the age. So he is with us, the good coach, and by the way, not just on the sideline, in the game, walking alongside us, prepared and present. Prepared and present. So this season, let's take a moment. Let's get quiet. Let's put away our second-rate go-tos and go to Jesus, who is the one who is far better. What might it take? Imagine what this Christmas would be like if we were more prepared for Jesus' arrival and counterintuitively prepared in a way that means stopping and taking a break and resting. What might it look for you? I want to invite you to go to God and ask him very specifically, Lord, what is it that you would have me do or not do as I prepare for Christmas this year? What is it that you would have me do? Like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a coach. What is it that you'd like me to do to be prepared and present this Christmas? Does it mean putting away social media for a time? Putting a limit on how much time I look at my phone? I was convicted of that last week after talking about go-tos. I think my phone is often a go-to for me, and it's a substitute. That's a poor substitute for a relationship with Jesus. Now, it's not like our phones or social media are a horrible thing. In fact, right now, praise the Lord, we're utilizing that tool to connect together. But there is a healthy balance. And so ask God, what is it, Lord, that you would have me do? And I'm talking to kids and teenagers and adults right now, all of you, to say, Lord, how do you want me to prepare my heart to greet you with expectation on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and for the future. Perhaps uh, one idea is every night, maybe light a candle as we think about how Jesus divides, um, brings, uh, illuminates the darkness, light a candle and perhaps go to God's word and we're going to put on social media the scripture passage that we're gonna dig into next week. So perhaps every night this week, you as a family or you individually read through that story, those few verses, as we anticipate and prepare for Jesus' presence. Maybe that's one way. We'll go to God and ask. Maybe you need some accountability. I know for me, it's one thing to set a uh, goal. It's another thing to say, hey, would you hold me accountable? Perhaps you text a friend and you say, hey, this is what I'm aiming to do. Would you ask me about it once a week? Or would you ask me about it, whatever the routine is, so that I can be disciplined to do it or to not do it, to step away from something? So think about it. Make some adjustments. Next week, it's Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 25 we're going to dig into uh, as we turn our hearts to who God is, how he coaches, how he promises to prepare and be present in among us. Allow your heart to be quieted in just the way you need it under the care of the best, best coach ever, Jesus. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, uh, thank you for your invitation to be in relationship with you. Um, no strings attached. And thank you that you and your goodness just extend a, a, an invitation to relationship with us that has nothing to do with who we are or what we've done or where we've been. It's all about your love for us. There is not one person who is uh, listening to this prayer who is not loved desperately by God, the best coach ever. And so would you lead us, Jesus, to do or not do whatever you're calling us as we prepare for you? Holy Spirit, we invite you to come in individually, in, in our families, in our homes, and in Oasis Church, that we might encounter you in a brand new way and find rest, to find rest in you. You're good. Thank you for, for your goodness. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I invite you to respond to this God of ours by worshiping together.
This song is awesome, so powerful. Um, maybe it's the first time you've heard it, so you just need to listen and take it in. Sit back, close your eyes, or you're ready to jump in and, and sing. Uh, but let's worship him.
Well, as we come to an end of our time together, I want to invite you, if you feel led by God, to give back to him out of the abundance that he's given you. Um, you are able to share your offering by texting 84321, and uh, you'll just be prompted there. You'll need to put in an amount there, and that can be for one time or uh, reoccurring. Uh, so we invite you to be a part of the, what God's up to in Oasis Church in that way, if he leads you to do so. Uh, it's been a blessing to be together today. I pray that God does much with what his word has shared with us, what he and his Holy Spirit's power has shared with us. And now it's time for a blessing. So uh, receive this sending, this blessing from, from the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit and Jesus the Son. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you again next week and on social media between here and there.